session this week with Professor Miranda Schroes from the Technical University. My name is Gesa Ludeke and I'm the Director of Graduate Programs here at the Rachel Kaiser Center and together with Christoph Mau, the Director of the RCC and Moderating. And as you can see today, uh, I'm doing the moderation um, and I'm very excited that we have Miranda for today. Um, Miranda is uh, from the Technical University, as I mentioned before, and from the Toome School of Governance where she holds the Chair of Environment and Climate Policy. Um, but before moving to Munich, which is like five years ago, I guess? Six, six years already. Um, she's been researching and teaching uh, pretty much all over the world, I can, I can say. Just to give you a few numbers, she uh, uh, worked at several universities in Japan and in the Netherlands, and of course in the US, where she's from. At Harvard and um, at the University of Maryland, where she was a professor at the Department of Government and Politics. And um, in 2007, she started working in Germany as the director of the Environment Environmental Policy Research Center uh, at the Freie Universität in Berlin. And there, she was also a professor of comparative politics. Um, she is an advisor on. I would say several environmental committees, some of them are German uh, federal government committees. And in 2011, former, German, uh, former Chancellor Angela Merkel appointed her uh, as a member of the German Ethics Commission on the Safe Energy Supply. She studied agriculture and life sciences in, in, at the University of Washington, uh, where she also did her Master of Arts in International Studies. Uh, she did her PhD in Comparative Politics at Michigan State University. So you get an idea of how interdisciplinary and international Miranda's background is. And if you want to talk or learn more about international politics and climate politics, um, then I guess Miranda's the person to talk to. Um, Fiona can tell you more about that because, <laughs> as she just said, uh, she works closely with her. Um, today she will introduce us to her work on energy supply and energy politics, especially climate politics, in the EU and in Germany. And she will share insights about the current debates on pretty much all political levels, in the, uh, 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 how to solve the energy crisis that has been caused by the Russian war on Ukraine. So very current, uh, very topical. Um, and we will have a look at maybe discussion about the major implications for energy and climate politics. I learned uh, that you have a talent for languages, that besides your first language of English, you speak German, Dutch, and Japanese. Very exciting. And um, yes, I think we should get started. Uh, time is running, and I leave the floor to you, and help me to welcome Professor Miranda Schwerz. Maybe I'll stand because somehow your voice carries better when you stand. So um, I picked a topic which is very, very current. It's very um, worrisome. It's something that's very real. It will impact all of us. Um, and actually, it's a topic that is intertwined. I'm going to talk about the war in the Ukraine, but I'm also going to talk about the climate change policy. And I'm going to start there. Um, so those of you who are working in the environmental field, the Rachel Carson Center, um, you certainly have spent a little time talking about climate change in the past, but I'm not sure how deeply you've been following this issue. And I would say this is perhaps the single most urgent crisis the planet has ever faced. And I say this because I'm not sure that most people understand that climate change is not just another pollution problem. It's really an existential problem. So just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this graph shows you greenhouse gas emissions from 1750, which is what we call the pre-industrial era, through to today. And you can see that from 1750 until 1850, and even, you could argue, until 1950, there were not big changes in terms of the amount of greenhouse gases that were going into the atmosphere. But what we've seen since the end of World War II, and especially since about the 1970s, is this huge rise in greenhouse gas emissions. 
Initially, the emissions were coming largely from the United States, North America, and we have East Asia join us, Japan, Korea, and more recently you see the emissions, this red part here coming from China. So as the world develops economically, we're seeing more and more countries emitting more and more greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what does that mean when we look at it? Many of you have a historical dimension to your work. What, what does that mean when we think of this from a historical perspective? This is 800,000 years of time, and it's measuring the amount of carbon dioxide, the most important of the greenhouse gas emissions, until today. And what you see is that we have already levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we have not seen for 800,000 years. And other fields would say we haven't seen them for 4 million years. And if you think about how long humans, as we have known them, have been on the planet, we're talking about the time frame of humans on the planet. We have never seen the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere in the lifespan of humans as a species. And that's part of what has the scientific community very nervous, that we are entering a, a, a realm of unknown. What happens when the CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions rise to a level where perhaps the natural system can't maintain a natural cycle? And what we should also remember, how long have we had civilization? You know, different historians will give you different time frames, but let's say 10,000 years of civilization. In this 10,000 years of time, we have not seen average temperatures vary by more than one degree Celsius up and down. We're already at 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. So we're really entering this era of unknown. What we do know is that we're starting to see more weather extremes. We're starting to see more hurricanes and floods and droughts and sea level rise that we haven't experienced in earlier times. So yes, we've always had uh, hurricanes and yes, we've always had heavy rainfalls. But we can now document that the frequency of these events and the impact of the events, you know, how, how, how heavy that rainfall is, is shifting from one in every thousand or one in every 10,000 year kind of storms that are now happening in one in every 100 years, or one in every 50 years. We're seeing um, things intensify. We also know that global sea levels have risen already several centimeters in the last hundred years. So we're expecting as temperatures rise that sea levels will rise. Um, and the scientific community, which has been working on this issue for several decades, um, in 1988, the international community set up something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change because they wanted to take bias out of the science. And so they said to world governments, okay, all of you contribute scientists to this panel. There are now about 10,000 scientists who contribute to this community. Um, and tell us what the science says about climate change. So they come out with a periodic reports, and, and one of the most recent is the sixth assessment report. And this sixth assessment report basically says, wake up, we're in trouble. We have a very, very short amount of time left if we want to keep global temperatures from skyrocketing. In 2015, the world uh, came together in Paris and um, established the Paris Climate Agreement. I'm sure many of you um, have heard about it. The Paris Agreement um, uh, was the first 
global agreement that we all need to do something on this issue. And the global agreement was, let's try to keep the temperatures from rising above 2 degrees centigrade, and let's try to keep them within 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. We can pretty well figure out, as greenhouse gas emissions accumulate in the atmosphere, where temperatures are likely to go. So we know about how much more carbon dioxide we can take into the atmosphere before we hit 1.5 degrees and then we hit 2 degrees. The scientific community is saying we have about 8 years left. We have about 8 years to cut greenhouse gas emissions, look at this, by 43% of their 2019 levels. 43% of 2019 levels. So I'm going to take us back to this slide here. 1990 would be, I'm sorry, that's always a problem with these things. 1990 would be about here. So we have to take emissions back by about 43% of 1990 levels. Look at what that means globally. The amount of CO2 emission reductions that we're talking about. We're talking about a revolution that needs to happen. An industrial revolution, a lifestyle revolution, a um, energy revolution. Um, and it's a challenge because we never really, as a global community, have ever had to try to deal with something this big or this serious before. So, take us back here. Um, one of the challenges is, of course, that not every country is admitting equally to this problem. Um, historically, like I said before, the United States and the European Union were the big emitters. And um, probably most of you aren't chemists. So if you, if you look at greenhouse gas emissions, um, you have to understand that many of the greenhouse gases, there's, there's a dozen different greenhouse gases, that they have different lifespans in the atmosphere. Some of them are in the atmosphere for 12,000 years. Some of them are in the atmosphere for 11 years. Carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere for about 250 years. So all CO2 emissions that have been emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution are still hanging out in the atmosphere. And that's how come the global warming problem is also a historical one. Everything we emit today will still be in the atmosphere in 250 years. And in some cases, in 10,000 years, when we're talking about some of the greenhouse gases. China is today the world's biggest emitter. China, I just looked yesterday, has 1,100 something coal fired power plants in operation. India has under 300, Germany has 68. The IPCC told us we cannot build any more new coal-fired power plants anywhere in the world if we want to maintain this 1.5 degree target. But coal-fired power plants are still being built actively in China. China is planning to put enough capacity on coal-fired power plants to equal um, all of the coal-fired power plants in Germany just this next year. India, which is far less developed in terms of its um, economy and in terms of its per capita CO2 emissions, is also saying we need the right to develop. We need the right to have access to energy. So how can you tell us we shouldn't be doing coal-fired power plants? That's one of the challenges. History is impacting the arguments of countries today. Who has the right to emit how much? And then if you're, these are just the big emitters. And I say the big emitters, Australia is 1%, Turkey is 1%, Germany is about 2%. All of the African countries, many of the Southeast Asian countries, emit 0 .00 something. So they're not really big contributors, but they're the ones that are going to get impacted. They're the ones who are going to suffer most from 
50 degree temperatures like we're seeing now in Bangladesh and Pakistan and in India, or sea level rise that is making extremes more serious. So that's part of the political challenge here, that different countries really see this issue very differently. Um, I mentioned that the per capita CO2 emissions are quite different country to country. So I grew up in the United States, the average American emits 14.4 tons of carbon per person. Arguments are, yeah, but it's a cold country, big distances, you need your car, you need to heat the house, plus it's an industrial country, with a lot of fossil fuels. And you look at China, China is rapidly catching up. China is emitting seven tons of carbon per person. It has a much bigger population, 1.4 billion, the United States, 350 million. So China, on a per capita basis, is emitting a lot less than the U.S., but about the same amount as the average European. Germany is about 9 tons, well, here it's 8 tons, Poland is 7.5 tons per person, Italy 5, the U.K. 5, Spain 4. Average in Europe is about seven, about the same as China. So this all plays into it. When you're in India, you're like, come on, guys, we're only 1.7 tons. We are, we're not even at what it would take if everybody in the person had this in the world had the same right to CO2 emissions. I'd say maybe a little less than two tons per person. So India is about where we need to be on per capita CO2. Um, once again, wrong direction. We are seeing political change. Climate neutrality targets are starting to emerge. So what's climate neutrality? It means for all of the emissions you put into the atmosphere, you somehow take those emissions out. You plant trees, you um, shift over to renewable energy, you do energy efficiency, Basically, you emit very little, and you take whatever you emit out. The EU is saying by 2050, climate neutrality. Germany has upped its target to 2045. Finland, way ahead at 2035. China, big country. Russia, big country, are both saying 2060. India is saying 2070. From a climate change perspective, it's a good step in the right direction, but it's nowhere near fast enough. So we're moving towards change, but we actually still have a lot more we need to do. And then we get the Russian war in Ukraine. So what's this going to mean? And I hope we can have some discussions about this. The Russian war in Ukraine, if you ask me, is one of these moments in history that will be remembered as a turning point in geopolitics. It means that Europe, which has been following an Ostpolitik with the former Soviet Union for the entire period since 1949, um, is now shifting out of an Ostpolitik. An Ostpolitik was the philosophy that you have in international relations that if you integrate economically, the chances that you go to war with each other decline, especially if you integrate on the elements that are necessary for war. In Europe, that was the coal and steel community, you integrate European countries, you basically tie Germany to, um, to France, to Italy, and you lessen the likelihood of a new war in Europe. Same idea was used with um, the former East, um, the Dede era, with the Soviet Union, the idea you integrate, you would maintain dialogue and negotiations. And that was the energy strategy of Europe, especially Germany, vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and then Russia. You build pipelines, you integrate the economies, and that lessens the likelihood of war. Or so we thought which means that maybe we didn't quite get the theory completely right. I still like the theory. I still like the idea of integration and trying to find means of peace. 
but maybe there was also a certain naivety here in Europe and a willingness to close our eyes to Russian aggression in Chechnya, followed by Georgia, followed by the uh, Krim crisis, the Crimea, Donetsk, Luhansk. There have been at least four, some people would say five conflicts that Russia has been the aggressor on in the last 20 years. And nevertheless, we continued an energy politics that was tied to our climate politics here in Europe. So what did we do? For years, we have been importing a lot of fossil fuels from Russia, saying this is necessary for the transition on climate change. Can um, see this if you look at European uh, electricity generation. This takes us through 2018. I couldn't find anything more recent in graphic form, but it hasn't changed that much. Let's see, I keep pressing the wrong things. Here is our dependency on coal and oil and gas from Russia, in large part from. Our electricity is still very much based on fossil fuels. So yes, we've been developing renewables here, but we haven't been doing anything far enough and fast enough to decouple ourselves from, from fossil energy. And we see this a little bit in terms of the uh, imports that Europe has from Russia. We are importing 45% in 2019, 43% of our natural gas from Russia. And Russia is about 60% of German gas supply just before the war. Um, some other countries are even more dependent on Russia for their gas. North Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Moldova, all for 100%. Finland for 94%, Latvia 93%. So very, very heavy dependency that we allowed us to establish. And you might ask, why were we spending so much money building gas pipelines instead of investing just one pipeline, 9 billion euros? Just imagine what could have been done with that money to develop renewables or to develop energy efficiency programs. So this is the um, now infamous Nord Stream 2 pipeline project, which was an effort to bypass the Eastern European countries and the Ukraine and basically take gas directly from Russia through waterways to Germany. If you do that, then you also don't have to pay transit fees through the Eastern European countries. And even though Poland screamed at us, and Latvia screamed at us, and Estonia screamed at us, and said, don't do it, because it makes us economically too dependent on Russia, and it can be used as a political weapon against Europe, we pushed forward on these policies. So that's what I mean when I say naivety. We really allowed us ourselves to, to buy into arguments that this was good for European energy security as well as it was going to help us make a transition to renewables. Now we're in crisis because suddenly all of that fossil fuel that we have been importing from Russia is not first step we took in reaction to the war was about a month later, six weeks later, we said, okay, we're going to put an embargo on coal. So we are no longer, as of the end of August, importing any coal into the European Union. That's a big step, but not that big of a step. One, we weren't importing that much coal. And two, you can easily get coal via ship from other places. More important is the very recent decision, only um, a few weeks ago, that we are going to have an embargo on Russian oil, which means that by the end of this year in Europe, we will no longer be able to import oil from Russia, with the exceptions of Hungary and I believe also Slovakia, that are still going to um, import some oil from 
So about 90% of Russian oil imports are to be stopped. The reality is, is in the meantime, a lot of this oil and coal is being bought up by China and India. Um, so it's kind of shifting the fossil fuel um, uh, geopolitics around the planet. Although Europe has done something um, which is interesting, they are now also going to um, they're going to sanction insurance. So you can't get your ships insured if you want to transport Russian oil and gas. And so that will also hit many other countries, um, including India, where a lot of insurance for ships happens to be from Europe. Um, the big one, though, because this is where the most money is, the largest amount of uh, import dependency is in and around gas. So Europe has not managed yet to say it's going to have an embargo of Russian gas. But what it is doing is um, it's reducing the demand for gas, the dependency on Russia for gas. And it's also saying, uh, in order to do this, we need a, a new European infrastructure. It's going to try to connect the European countries much more integrally so that they have a stronger market themselves. Um, they're going to start building liquid natural gas terminals so that you can import gas by ship rather than by pipeline, bringing it in from as far away as Canada and the United States. Um, and new partnerships instead of with Russia, with various Middle East countries, as well as from a lot from Norway and the Netherlands, um, and to some extent even Venezuela. This is the part I like better, because what I was talking about until now is basically just trying to shift from where do we get our fossil fuels. But what we are also seeing is a new emphasis on how do we link this crisis and the need to rethink our energy policy to that climate change problem I was talking about. And my big question is, do we have the political willpower to do it? This is the moment in time, you call it a window of opportunity, a moment for change. When you say, we should be doing it, we have to do it. We have to do it for climate reasons, we should do it for moral, ethical reasons, vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in the Ukraine. And we should really, really pursue energy efficiency and energy saving. There is no more important climate policy than to reduce our energy use. So we actually should turn the lights off in this room. There's nothing more important we can do than to cut back um, how much gas, how much oil we are using, especially in transportation, one of the biggest uses, but also in heating and cooling of buildings. And there are lots of ways to do it. There's a lot of technological ways you can do it, smart metering, for example, but there's a lot of lifestyle ways you can jumping on the bicycle instead of taking the car, or even instead of taking the metro. So um, every step in this direction is an important one. The other big and exciting area is the question, can we now use this as a change model in terms of expanding renewables? Germany will be revising its renewable energy policies this summer, and the expectation is that we will try to target 100% renewable electricity by 2035, which you have to remember also means not just our current electricity use, but all those cars that are supposed to be electrified by then, and increasing the buildings that are to be heated and cooled with electricity. So electricity use is expected to increase, and uh, renewable electricity is to totally expect. And you think, wow, is that really doable? But let me take you back to China. Last year, China put more solar power capacity in, in one year's time, than Germany did in 20 years ago. Last year alone, China did more wind power than the rest of the world combined over the last five years. So, mega change is possible, 
But the question is, are we here in Europe willing, willing to do what it's going to take to make this happen? Plus, we need a couple of other countries on board, like the United States. I think we have some policies that are moving us in this direction. The European Green Deal, I absolutely love the ideas behind it. It means we need to shift towards climate neutrality, renewable energy, circular economy, philosophical, theoretical, ethical ideas. Now we just need to figure out how do we implement them. And now I'm ready for discussion. So